Hi everyone, welcome. Thanks for stopping in. Um, this is my first live, so I'm going to hopefully make it through without disconnecting you guys. But today I'm gonna show you all about how to gather things that you have around your house that you can use when you are working with your, hi guys, when you are working with your kids at home. So all these things are things that you already have. Um, I know a lot of us are tempted or just to order things off Amazon or go to Target and we're trying to really stay at home. So the whole premise of this is to walk around your house and find things that you already have that you can use with your kids. So the first step we're gonna do, the first thing we're gonna talk about is creating a workspace for your child. So the first thing I have is I have a box. Um, it was a leftover either Amazon box, maybe a LaCroix box. And then I, hi you guys. And then I found a brown paper bag and I cut it and I went ahead and just wrapped my box. You'll even notice I think it's from Safeway. Um, and that way my daughters have their own work spot, their own drawer for a desk that they make. We found just a cup. You can use an old can, an old ice cream jar to put their own supplies in it. Again, you're just finding things around your own house um, to give them a sense that they have their own workspace. And you can put any of the materials that we're using today can go right in here, go under their bed. They can pull it out when it's time to work again. Um, but that way they have their own set of things and it'll help them feel like they're at school because at school they have their own desk, they have their own spot. There's the, the teacher has her own supplies or his own supplies, the kids have their own. And there's a piece of ownership that our kids are missing when even though they're in their own or they're in our own house or their own home, they don't have their own supplies like at school. So set up a supply station. So that's the first one. Okay, so then as I go through all the other items, I do want to point out that when we think about our learners, um, we know as teachers and parents, you are probably learning this as you go, that there are four different types of learners. So which means that people learn in four basic different ways. Visual learners, which means they're watching demonstrations, they're watching you do something, and then they try it on their own. Auditory learners, which means they learn best by listening. So podcasts really work really well, or even just being able to listen to verbal directions and instructions. The third one is tactile learners. I'm gonna scroll up just a little bit. Um, these are people that do really well with hands-on activities um, or taking notes. And the fourth type is kinesthetic learners. And those are the learners that work best when they are moving. Um, and so sometimes if you have a child, for example, that you notice can't sit still when they're working, they might be one of those kinesthetic learners. And I encourage you to let your child stand or let them rock in their chair um, because sometimes they just need to move a little bit or to act out to act out um, what they are learning. So a lot of the things I'm gonna show you today, um, I'm gonna to try to hit all four of our different types of learners, but I'm, but I'm really gonna zone in on our tactile learners, which are the ones that touch, and our kinesthetic learners, which are the ones that need to move and to act things out. Um, because those two, you kinda of have to get a little more creative as adults. We usually have figured out what type of learner we are and in the workplace or even in the world, we do all four visual and auditory are two skills that adults we have really zoned in on and gotten used to and so tactile and kinesthetic sometimes get forgotten but those are two really important ones for kids okay so we went over the box setup um the next one which is probably something all that we have in our house is a remote so make sure you take the batteries out first um i recommend using this one so all the things i'm going to show you today are math that's the other thing I was gonna share with you. I'm gonna do a whole nother, let's get resourceful for reading and for writing on another day. Today's is all gonna be about math. So when you're using your remote, take the batteries out. This is great for when you are having them practice math, when they're practicing their math facts. You say, what's two plus three? And again, your visual kids are trying to visualize what two plus three look like in their brain. But you say, what's two plus three? And they could say, okay, two, plus three. So they're looking at the numbers, they're touching the numbers, and then they're doing the math in their head. This is also a great one for word problems. So if you read the word problem to your child, or if they read it to themselves, anytime they read a number, have them stop, touch the number on the remote, push the button, 
because they are taking a moment to really think about, okay, this is the number and I'm doing something. I'm kinesthetically moving my body as I think of this number and it's going to register in my brain. So that's the first one is your remote. The second one is a toilet paper roll, which we all have a lot of. So when you have one of these that's empty and I started one over here is all you do is you take a pair of scissors and you're going to cut rings and I would cut maybe one roll into four rings. I would suggest I'm going to cut the other ones right now. So there's four rings and you're going to sit them on the table and you can do this if your child is working on addition um, really easily, but definitely multiplication and division. Because again, if they're learning visually, they can see it. If they're learning tactically or kinesthetically, they need to touch the things, they need to count the groups. So what are you gonna put in the toilet paper rolls that you already have at home? We have tons of Legos. So you could do this with Legos. If you don't have Legos, I went outside. You can even send your kids outside and find some small rocks that you could use. So. Here we go. I'm going to turn my flip my phone around. That way you can see what I am doing when it comes to multiplication and division. Okay, so I have my rings and I'm going to focus on, again, for multiplication, for addition, let's start with addition. So if you're doing addition, you're saying, okay, you're going to add two smaller groups together. What is three plus two? And you're going to have your child actually drop in the three over here and the two over here. Or two plus three, they could flip it around. It's the same as three plus two. And you have one of your math properties right there. What is it? When you put them all together, you have five. So the other thing is you could do is you could start with five. And if you're doing subtraction, you could say, okay, take two away. What do you have left? You have three. So again, the child is the one that's moving the Legos. You are the one that's saying the problem or writing the problem down for them to see. So that's addition, subtraction. Here we go. Multiplication and division. Again, I'm gonna go ahead and use the Legos. They fit really well in these. So when we talk about multiplication and division, this is huge when we're talking about groups of. So blank groups of blank is blank. So if we say four times two, we're actually saying four groups of two. So in each of the four groups, they are to put two. Oh, that one got split up. And then you have them check. Again, they're moving the Legos. Are there four groups? Yes, there's four groups. Are there two in each? Yes, there's two in each. How many all together? Two, four, six, eight. Or they can lift them up and count them. This is also work. This also works if you're talking about skip counting. So let's say if you're doing division, and let's say your number is six divided by two. So you're gonna take six and you're gonna put them into two equal groups. Okay, you get a Lego, you get a Lego, you get a Lego, you get a Lego, and so on. Six divided into two equal groups is three or six, and you know you're gonna to have to have two in each group. How many groups are there? There's three. So this is a really concrete way, a really kinesthetic and tactile way to teach and to review multiplication and division with your kids using a toilet paper roll. Okay, so the next one, I'm gonna flip you back so that you can see me. Our next item that we have um, is a sponge. And I'm gonna use a sponge and I'm gonna use scissors. And what you are gonna do is you're gonna cut off one end of your sponge to make one strip. This is for an odd number, we're gonna put it odd and even. And then with the rest of the sponge, you're gonna cut it into a letter V because the letter V represents even. So I'm going to flip my camera one more time for you guys. And that way you can see what I'm doing. Here we go. So odd and even I'm going to move my toilet paper rolls out. 
The concept of odd and even seems simple to grown-ups, but to kids it takes some time for them to learn. So, for example, if you have five things and you say, is it odd or even, you tell them, you tell your kid, anytime you have to use, anytime there's one left over, it's an odd number. It would, it's all by him lo his lonesome self. So, here we go. Take your even. There's two. They match up. They're together. Here's two, they match up, and look, there's one left, odd Todd, there's one left, so five is an odd number. Let's try it again with the number six. Line them up. Again, you can use rocks, Legos, whatever you have. Have them count out the six. Get your odd and even pieces ready. Here we go. Okay, those two go together. Those two go together. These two go together, and there's none left, so you know it is even. Another thing that we do in our house is that um, we have two kids, so this works out really well, is odd and even days. So, for example, if the girls are um, arguing over who gets to pick the show or a show for that day, I'll say, what's the date? Is it odd or even? Today's the 11th. So I asked um, Paisley, my five-year-old, and she said, 11. That's 10 and 1. 1, one left over. Odd. So that's another way to really easily talk about odd and even in your house. Okay, next up, we have our egg crate. Now this one is super big. This one I think is from Costco, but even if you have a smaller one, that's fine. You'll have two rows that look like this. Um, this is great for when you're talking about area, and again, multiplication, because when you talk about area, we're talking about how many inside, right? How many boxes inside? So when you do that, have them draw out the boxes. If it's four by six, one, two, three, four, they're counting the lines, not the dots, and six over. It's really important to think about when you're telling them it's four down, that they're not counting the dots because that's not what it is. You're counting the space, you're counting the area, the area model. You could also use it as a 10 frame. So. 10 frame is a frame made up of 10 smaller frames. Um, we use this a lot in math. A teacher might have a fancy looking one like this. At home, even this morning, I went ahead and just drew one um, for Paisley. It's not perfect, but you can tell it's, it's, a, it's a 10 frame. Most of the boxes are relatively the same size. And when we teach kids to use 10 frames, we are teaching them to anchor to five and to 10 to easily count and see numbers. So I'm gonna flip my camera for you so that you can follow along with me. I'm gonna show you how to use a 10 frame that I drew, and then I'm gonna show you how to use a 10 frame also on the A crate. So when you are building number fluency, and you say, show me three, one, two, three, you always t encourage them to fill top, left to right, before you come into the bottom row, just like how we read. Here we go. If, then you'd have them clear it. Show me seven. Okay, so again, you're encouraging them. The child is the one that fills the board. When they count it, they're gonna wanna count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which is great, but you also wanna encourage them. The more they do it is that you say, you know this is five, the top row is full. You know it's five because there aren't any open. Five six, seven, we're counting on, you're building on five, which is a foundational skill. If you use it with your egg crate, and again, this is a big one, I would recommend drawing your lines first on here, and then you can put it in here. The egg crate's kind of fun because if your child is someone that, that likes that sensory stimulation, it has a different texture to it, you can use it as your 10 frame. Okay, let's see what next we have on the list. Um, oh, here's another one. So for area or perimeter, when you're figuring out how the length of something around the perimeter, the area is what's inside. I have a bunch of old tea bags in their packages and I would just line them up. So I'll show you a quick area model that represents six because you are counting how many squares inside your model. So here is six. It's easy to see six squares. If you were to do this, half a six, that's three. One, two, three. 
the measurement is one, two, three on the top and one across. So when you're teaching area and perimeter, this is a really concrete way, hi, for, um, for you, for them to see what it means when you're counting things inside for the area model or counting around for the perimeter. So when you think of one square unit, this is your square, it's one by one. Two square units, it's one by two. Okay. The next thing we have, which is a kind of funny one, is the next one is you can use a belt or you can use a garden hose if you wanna use it outside. And you're gonna lay it out flat. And the whole idea with this is that you are working on building a number line. A number line, as adults, we don't think about it too much unless you're using like a tape measure, but for kids, understanding the number line, it's foundational. You think about thermometers, you think about sequencing, putting things in, in order. Um, it also leads the foundation for negative numbers, which is down the road. So you lay out your belt, you lay out your garden ho hose, and you can either write numbers on paper or if you have cards, give them a stack of cards and have them put the numbers in order. So you could say, okay, if this is where 10 is going, where is three gonna go? Is it gonna go right next to it? Do we need to leave some space in between for the other numbers? So you're really talking about math and you can ask them, you can sit back in your, in your chair and you could say, okay, if I were to give you 13, where would it go? And they should tell you, and then you could say, well, why? How do you know? Ask them questions, make them talk to you about math, make them talk to you about their thinking. If they're learning fractions, you can do it on a number line. Looking at the numbers between zero and one. One third is a number between zero and one. One fifth is a number between zero and one. Three fifths is a number between zero and one. Give them a deck of cards and have them put them in order to work on the number line. Again, it's a tactile, it's a kinesthetic, it's a visual, and it's an auditory one if you are having them explain their thinking to you. So that's your number line. Um, let's see what else. Oh, this is a fun one. Paisley came up with this one. She copied her teacher, her classroom teacher, Mrs. Couch, who usually does this. She got out three cups, ones, tens, and hundreds to help count the, the number of days of mama's school we've had, or Mrs. Couch does it for her school, her classroom. And the whole idea is every time they get to 10, there's 10, this says, this is a one, because she's already regrouped when you get 10, then you bundle it with a rubber band into a group of 10. So we are talking about regrouping. We're talking about how ones, ones move to the tens place when it becomes one group of 10 or 10. I bet if you were to start explaining this to your kid, they would say, no, 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 I know how to do it. I, I got it, I got it, I'm fine. We use straws and we use rubber bands for that one. Um, this is also a great one. So this one was regrouping at 10 but you could also regroup for groups of three. If you're talking about counting by threes or working on multiplication, you have three, six, nine. You're having them bundle groups of three or having them bundle groups of four, whatever it is that they're working on, whatever math fact they're working on. Okay, we have three more to do, two more. The first one has to do with rocks again, or Legos, whatever you have. So I'm going to flip my screen for you so that you can follow along. All right, so if you have your rocks or your Legos or a combination and you wanna talk about patterns, well, you could do a pattern is always red, blue, red blue, red, or a pattern is always blue, red, rock, blue, red, rock. Those are called repeating patterns. There's a certain part that's always going to repeat and it's predictable. The other one is a growing pattern. So let's say in this pattern, it starts with one and then two and then three. And if you see it's a growing pattern, 
the number is getting larger. The next one's going to be four. Again, predictable, but you want to teach the kid to act out the pattern so they're looking at that and knowing that the number is getting larger. And our very last thing we're going to share today is an activity where your child gets to use their favorite toy. So I just pulled out one of Reese's favorite toys. You can see it's well-loved, kind of like the Velveteen Rabbit. And for this one, it's all about measurement. So I'm teaching her that when you measure, you measure from the top to the tail of how long something is. So for example, if I lay on the ground, I could say, Reese, how tall am I? How many dinosaurs am I? And I'm teaching her that you want to leap, you want to start the top to the top, all the way here, and then another dinosaur, and then another dinosaur, and another dinosaur. So you're teaching them the foundations of measurement. Measurement. You can also talk about having them measure their room. You could give them their toy and say, I want to know how many uh, army men lengths it is from your door to your bed, or I want to know the length and the and the width of your room. You could add in some academic vocabulary there. You could also have them measure a table and you could ask them for the length and the width and the depth of it or the height. All these are ac academic words that our children are exposed to over and over and over at school. But sometimes now that they're home, they might not be hearing those. So it's important for us as an adults to try to bring out some of that language and to take the time to let them explore math in their own home. So... That's all I have for today. These were all tools that we had in our house that I just walked around and picked up and thought about, hmm, how can I use this as an educational tool? How can I use this to make learning a little bit more fun for my kids so that they're not just doing worksheets, right? If you think about the difference between doing a measurement worksheet or measuring with your dinosaur, this one's way more fun. It's way more interactive. And I bet you they're gonna remember it more when they get to measure with their dinosaur than measuring on a worksheet. So we're making math come alive, we're making learning come alive, and that's what your kids' teachers do. And that's what they would be doing if they were in the classroom. So we're trying our best, you're doing a great job. Make sure you check back for another video. Um, I'll be jumping into reading and writing and getting resourceful for those as well in the next coming weeks, and I'll see you then, bye.